stand the reading of God's holy word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There's a testimony and the testimony is about Jesus. Teresa, would you hit that? Amen? God's testimony is about the cross. Amen. You all remember old churches when you all stand up and give testimony night? God would stand up and talk about the cross. And he's going to say something to us about it. Amen? Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you so much for your love. And now, Lord, we just come and, and you know, as Tony was just sharing what he shared um, already about your finished work of the cross, that's been my prayer. My prayer is, Father, that we're not just educated and reminded of just the wonderful work of the cross, but something will awaken in our faith. Something will be satisfied and take hold and it will change the way we view our life because of what you, through Jesus Christ, have done for us. Holy Spirit, move on our hearts, move in our minds, move in our ears, move in my mouth, I pray, as we simply proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Turn around and say to one another, the Father has a testimony for you. Go ahead, would you please? So we're leading up to our next week's resurrection celebration, and what we've been doing these past couple of weeks is focusing on the wonderful works of the cross. And the reason why we are doing this is because the resurrection of Jesus has the most impact in our lives when we view it through the lenses of his great sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, the resurrection of Jesus is never meant to be isolated. As we will look next week in the text, it says, this is the gospel that Christ died according to scriptures, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to scriptures. That's all together. We can't take one without the other. Amen? Now, to embrace the wonderful works of, of, of the cross is vital because, first of all, it's the foundational part of our salvation. Amen? But like what we were just talking about, it's the testimony about God. Whenever you want to know, God, what are you saying to me today? God, what is up today? God, how are you feeling about me today? The Father will always say something in respect to the powerful work of the cross of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in it, well, why did he give the Son? That the Son may finish the work of the cross on your behalf. Amen? Amen. And rise again three days later. Now, remember last week, we looked at the first three primary works of the cross according to their theological terms. Remember we talked about expiation. Remember what expiation means? It means the removal of your sin. That Jesus literally removed your sin from you, shot it back through time on Jesus on the cross. Amen. Amen. Your sins was taken from you. By the way, can we say praise God? And because he took your sins upon himself, the next thing we saw is the mighty work of propitiation. That means that Jesus drew in the wrath of God that was coming against you for your sin, but Jesus drew it into himself since he bore your sin and appeased God by his shed blood. 
hey, y'all don't have to go to hell. Aren't you glad? Amen. So we have expiation, propitiation, and then we talked about reconciliation. Reconciliation isn't just saying, you know, everything's good, you're forgiven. That's not, that's not recon reconciliation is the welcome mat. Reconciliation is by the work of the cross, God made you fit for a relationship with him. God is a holy God. God is a perfect God. God is a just God. And we found out that on the work of the cross, Jesus provided our holiness. On the work of the cross, Jesus provided our perfection. We're perfect in the Lord. On the work of the cross, we are now justified. So we can have this relationship with him. This morning now, we want to look at the next three amazing works of the cross according to the theological words attached to them. Read, read these three words with me. They are substitution, nullification, redemption. Let's talk about substitution. Read, read Colossians 3.13 with me, would you? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hung on the tree. The substitutionary work of the cross is about this divine exchange. God gives his best, Jesus Christ, in our place to rescue us from our worst. Now here, what's fascinating is that we find the specific purpose for Christ's substitutionary work. It was to take on himself the God-assigned consequential curses that get activated in our lives when we disobey God's way. In short, because of the substitutionary work of the cross, Jesus reversed our curse. See, propitiation took God's wrath for our sin. But there are consequences we have to live with when we violate God's holy ways. Amen? Amen. The Bible tells us that, uh, that what we read in the Old Testament is given to us as examples concerning the destructive consequences for sin. When we break God's moral laws, when we set we, and when we, we go against and resist God's way, we set in motion destructive forces that affect our circumstances. These destructive forces is what the Bible calls curses. Let me give, give you one example. Have any of you ever seen the destructive force that a lie has? One lie can destroy relationships. One lie can re destroy futures. One lie can destroy a job. One lie. That, that is the curse behind that, that force. Right? Well, the Bible tells us that all of these things that we have done that violates God and violates His ways, are, attached with them are destructive forces. But here we find that what Jesus does is because he took our curse. He substituted himself on our behalf. What should have been ongoing destructive forces because of our poor choices, he redeems and he turns them into something good, into blessings. Um, Mary Haynes wrote a book about, oh, I want to say 25, 30 years ago now, um, called The Iceman, the story of Ron Rarick. Ron Rarick was a mafia thug, was a leg breaker for the mafia, and he was, the story was about the before and after, but he was one of the ones, in fact, the kingpin, who uh, robbed Heist TWA and stole all that money. He got caught. He got thrown in jail. Here is a man, his story was, it was a life cursed with depression, crime, addiction, misery, abuse. He was on the fast track of, of his life ending in violence, all because of his ongoing sinful choices. 
He got caught. He was thrown into prison. I've had the privilege of, of getting to fellowship with Ron more than, more than once. We've had dinner together several times. And, and Ron told me, he said, let me, let me tell you, man, if you ever want to know, if you don't believe demons are real and Satan is real, just sit in jail for a while. Because they manifest themselves to these people all the time. And he says, so I got thrown in jail and, and, and I needed to kind of establish myself as a kingpin and as the thug and I'm still in the mafia. And, and so, so, you know, he started pushing people around and, you know, broke arms, you know, that kind of thing. Well, he was, he was, he was a cellmate of a Christian. And so he thought, well, I have to establish my dominance over this guy. And so he stole the Christian's Bible. He had no clue what it was about. He just thought he likes that a lot. I'm going to steal it. And so he stole it. And one night, he didn't know why, but he was compelled to read the Word of God. And he kept, it, it, it just this Word, the words of life, the words, the power of the Holy Spirit started coming through. And by the time morning hit, he was on his knees weeping. The guy got born again. And because he looked to Jesus by faith, the substitutionary work of the cross began to take effect in this man's life. He had to go before the judge again for a, another arraignment. And the judge says, who is this man? He says, oh, I'm Ron Rick. He says, this is not the same man I saw. He is different. Something's changed. And he said, what's changed? And Ron Rarick says, I deserve to be here, but I want to tell you I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and he's in me, and he's changed me. His whole demeanor was changed. And he said, if I have to spend the rest of my days in jail, I want to spend it serving Jesus. And so the judge says, I don't know, because this judge was a, was a real stickler. He was a hangman judge. And he said, this is the first time I ever feel compelled to do this, but I'm going to set you free couldn't believe it so he got set free and he thought well I know that I'm saved and I know that God has called me to do his work so he figured well I used to break legs for the mafia God must want me to break legs for him <laughs> and so he told me he would go out into the park and would witness to people and if someone wanted to resist the gospel message or didn't want to hear him he'd start breaking their arm start roughing them up well, he said that there was this little, red-headed, skinny, college-age kid that saw what he was doing and said, that's wrong. you got to stop that in Jesus' name. And he turned around, and he was going to clean his clock, and he said, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Ron said, right then and there, boom, he fell down, and he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Stop breaking arms. But what he started doing was studying and getting into ministry. He's one of our four square pastors. God has taken the curses that was on his life, the oppression, the depression, the, the addictions, the hatred, the anger, the roughness, and has reversed it. And here is a man who loves Jesus who's ministering to people, who's living a life of worshiping God and has won a lot of souls to the Lord. The substitutionary work of the cross. You and I, now, let me tell you something. You and I, there are certain circumstances, consequences, that won't get erased, but they'll turn from a curse to a blessing. Have a child out of wedlock. That's not God's way. When you turn to the cross, does he take the child away? No. But the oppression, the guilt, the pain, the stuff that's all associated with it, he takes away and he'll save that child. And he'll move in that child's life. And he'll raise that child. And that child will win people to Jesus. He'll reverse the curse. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
That's why our policy around churches, there's no such thing as illegitimate children, just illegitimate parents. <laughs> you know, it's the truth. Amen. Well, not only a work of the cross was the substitutionary work where Jesus reverses our curse, but there's the work of nullification. Would you read Colossians chapter 2 with me, verse 14? Go ahead, let's read it together. Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Nullification is actually a judicial word, and it just means to render something legally void and inoperative. In the case of the work of the cross, the witness that the Old Testament law had against us has now been nullified. I was really fascinated with this, and for some reason my brain went into laws and different laws, and, and so I fell upon this one law. It was in, it's still on the books in Pocatello. It was written in 1948. Did you know it's against the law if you go to Pocatello to frown at any of the citizens? To frown or to scowl at them is against the law, and it's on the books. In fact, in 1998, I think one of our senators was talking about that. It's because the Pocatello said, we, we have the friendliest people, you know, in, in the West. You know, they, they mark themselves. And so when you, when you would frown at a person you were caught, you were taken to these special places that was around Pocatello called smiling stations. <laughs> And you had to go and show that you could smile. And if you didn't smile, you paid a fine. Well, that just, you got to know how my mind thinks. I said, that's amazing. I wonder if there's some other laws that's still on the books around America. Well, there are. People ignore them, but they're still on the books. Did you know in Rhode Island to this day, you're not allowed to sell both toothpaste and a toothbrush? to a person on Sundays? I think, I think it has to do with they thought it would violate the Sabbath by you know, having a person brush their teeth. I don't know, but it was against the law. You need toothpaste and toothbrush, you better bring your wife or your husband with you. You get the toothpaste, they'll get the toothbrush. Now get this, did you know in Gainesville, Georgia, the law says the only way you're allowed to eat fried chicken is with your hands. To which personally I say, was there any other way to eat fried chicken? <laughs> and also, did you know in North Carolina, it is against the law to sing off key. Tell you what, they make their revenue, man. They send agents to every church around the place on Sundays writing up these tickets, you know. It is. Oh, there, there's, there's a bunch of them. I was telling my wife, I said, I read one, and I, I forgot the place. It's in New Mexico. Ladies, did you know there's a place in New Mexico that's against the law for you to be in public if you didn't shave your legs or your armpits? There's a place in Michigan. <laughs> There's a place, yeah, listen, in first service this morning, Bruce goes, praise the Lord, good law. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a place in Michigan, it's called Lake Street. It's against the law to drive a red car on Lake Street. Yeah, there's all kinds of them out there. These are laws that are still on the books that people ignore. I want to tell you something. God in your life doesn't just ignore the Old Testament law that stood against us, that stood opposed to you. You see, according to the scriptures, that Old Testament law was this constant witness, not only to your conscience, but in the very courtroom of heaven that proved our condemnation. The Old Testament law proved as a constant witness in heaven that we were unworthy to ever receive any of God's blessings. It was there. But this law against us and that stood opposed to us has been nullified by the death of Jesus. 
This is why there's, the Bible says there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It wasn't just flowery words. He was making a legal statement. When you turn in faith and look to Jesus, God takes that Old Testament that was standing opposed to you, that was convicting you, and he says, it's done. Nailing it to the cross, it's now void in your life. See, the Old Testament was given to be your teacher, to lead you to Christ. The old law can never save anyone. All it could do is show us how bad we need a Savior. Amen? But once that's happened, the law fulfilled its work. That's why I don't understand why people, well-meaning people, think they can get closer to God by going back and doing parts of the old covenant law. You know, observing special days and doing this and doing that. That's why it says in Colossians, these were a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, praise God. There is nothing. Oh, the enemy might be condemning you, but that's just the enemy. There is not a law that can now stand opposed to you. For Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus canceled it by his shed blood. Wow. So we look at substitution we look at nullification, and the most familiar to all of us is the work of redemption. Read Ephesians 1, 7 with me, would you please? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Biblical redemption means to be bought out of the captivity of sin and provide it with the means for our total liberation and our ongoing forgiveness. That's what it means. When we usually think of redemption, we just think the price that, that it cost God, the blood of Jesus, to get us out of the slavery to sin, to get us free from that bondage to sin. And hallelujah, that's part of it, right? But I want you to think in terms of the ancient mind. Let's pretend that your five-year-old daughter got kidnapped. And sure enough, this would happen in those days. Someone would kidnap them and go to other cities and other towns and probably they would take them out of the country to other countries and they would sell these children into slavery. Redemption began for you when you took the money either yourself or you paid the expenses for one of your trusted servants to start looking for that child. It costs to look for that child. It costs to just go every place you could go. And sometimes it would take years and years and years to find that child taken from you. Once they found the child, all that expense incurred, once they found the child being sold in a slave market, then they would pay whatever the price they needed to pay to get her back. But listen, a five-year-old little girl that was taken to be a slave, if she's been held in bondage and in slavery, especially in a foreign land, she learned that education. She, by the time she's 12, is beat up. She is messed up. She is just, she is emaciated. She looks more like a slave than like that child. That's the way we came into the kingdom. But all oh, the price of redemption isn't finished yet. Just because she was bought out of slavery. Brothers and sisters, then they would start pouring money into her. They would start pouring money, let's get her cleaned up. They would say, let's, let's get her to a doctor quickly. Let's get her healthy again. Let's feed her. They would have to pour money into educating her so she can learn the language of her past. Let's pay the expenses to get her home. Let's pay the expenses of security so she's never taken again. 
And then once she's home, listen, it's not going to be all la ti da Think about it. Think about real world situations. They would have to go through weeks and months and maybe years of her being hurt and her being programmed to slavery and her being untrusting and just love her and love her and love her. But they got her back. But there's this process of finally setting her free from her slavery. Amen. In the very same way, brothers and sisters, the redemption that's provided for us on the cross didn't just get you out of the clutches of Satan and out of the bondage of sin. The redemption of the blood of Jesus is continually working in your life for Father God is bringing you back home, his home, the place where Jesus prepared for us, his home in heaven. That's why the Bible tells us so much about the blood of Jesus. I can't understand why churches aren't preaching about the blood. It's, you can't not preach about the blood of Jesus. It's no longer a Christianity without the redeeming blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. Think about all the different things the Bible tells about Jesus' shed blood has done to redeem us. It's what made peace between us and God, according to Colossians 1.20. It's the basis for our forgiveness, according to what Jesus said in Matthew 26.28. It's what breaks the chains of slavery to our sin, according to this verse. It's the constant source for our purification from sin. According to 1 John 1, 7, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, listen to the tense, is constantly purifying you from all sin. And then again in Revelation 1, 5, it says to Jesus Christ, the Lord, who has washed you with his blood. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus is what makes us holy and sanctified according to Hebrews 13, 12. It's what brought us into the new covenant with God according to what Jesus said in Luke 22, 20. It's the basis of our justification according to um, Romans 5, 9. And the Bible says in Acts 20, 28, it's what brought you and I to become a church. Did you know for you and I to become a church, it wasn't just our decision to start hanging with each other. We were bought by the blood of Jesus to become a church. All the things the Lord is constantly doing in our life, that's bringing his great redemption. Wow. All because of the work of the cross. No wonder why the Apostle Peter says this. Read it with me, would you? 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from this empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You're redeemed and you're being redeemed and that blood is still not finished doing its work in your Hallelujah. life thank you Jesus thank you Jesus all oh, that you and I would dare <coughs> to just believe the work of nullification if we would dare to just believe the work of substitution if we would just dare to believe the work of redemption that's God's testimony to you that's what God is up to how do you love me she says look to the cross that's how I'm loving you praise God Let's bow our hearts for just a second, shall we? <coughs> for those watching around the world on YouTube, 
This is the truth. And it's how God loves you. How God loves you is through Jesus and what Jesus did for you on the cross. All that God requires is for you to turn around from your life of sin and put your faith in Jesus. As a matter of fact, because you're hearing this and you're understanding this, it means God's grace is already working in your life. And it means God's grace is enabling you to now believe. You just make a statement to God, God, from this day forward, I want to place my full trust and my life in the Lord Jesus Christ and let the work of his cross work in me. Forgive me for all my sins. I now will follow Jesus who is alive to this very day. If you've prayed that and you're there, telling you God is doing a work of what the Bible calls you're being born again. The Holy Spirit came inside of you. But brothers and sisters, kind of feel like the Lord had told me that some of you, that you're holding on to the circumstances of your past mistakes and the destructive circumstances. And, and you know that you deserve it. You know that you're the one who did it. But what you don't, didn't realize until we started talking about it is Jesus wants to take that, reverse the destructive effect, and turn it into a blessing. Pastor, my body is so messed up because of the abuse I've done to it. Good. Let him reverse that curse now. Pastor, my finances are so messed up because of I just didn't listen to God and good bring it to the cross let him reverse that curse right now pastor my relationships are so messed up my lies my sin my stuff repent and let him reverse that curse right now because he will he will father we bring all the destructive things that we put in our own life before the cross and because Jesus was our substitution we now lay all these circumstances before him to reverse it and turn it redemptive for his glory in your holy name would you stand and let's take a little bit of time and let's pray for one another shall we <coughs> hallelujah